Good afternoon and welcome to this, the fifth NetBank ICT webinar um, on this, the 10th of December 2020. Former Deputy Minister Pak Stau and now the MEC for uh, Gauteng Province, um, Mr. Pak Stau, um, Ms. Catherine Kaufman, Head of Infrastructure, Water and Telecommunications at NetBank, Prof. Brian Armstrong uh, from Vet University. Um, Fred's Business School and a BCX Chair of Digital Business, and Mr. Alan Not Craig Jr., founder of uh, Project Isizwe in the city of Tswane. Good day to you all, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is Tabang Chilwani. I am the Executive Head, Group Strategic Relations and Public Affairs at NetBank. Prof. Barry uh, Jolaski and I will be your moderators for this session titled Broadening Access to the Internet in South Africa with ICT Infrastructure Investment in Southern African Municipalities. We have entered a, an age characterized by rapid and wide reaching gains in the technological uh, innovations that will profoundly reshape the way we live work and interact with each other. Much of this change is driven by access to the internet, which surpassed the 51% mark in 2018 in Southern Africa. It is difficult to predict the impact of this rapid transformation accurately, but several things are also evident. For example, almost every uh, expert working in the digital space agrees that the industry will be disrupted. This disruption could lead to greater levels of unemployment and inequality. While positive outcomes from this transformation are equally on the, on the horizon, the poor and the marginalized majority worldwide will not benefit from some of the uh, expected uh, benefits and the economic growth that might follow. In South Africa, the unequal distribution of these benefits consolidates an already entrenched digital divide. There are recommendations and ongoing interventions aimed at alleviating this challenge. So today our panel will address some of these issues which relate to internet access. The challenge of including many among the poor and disenfranchised people. Without stealing the thunder of our esteemed panel, Allow me to welcome them to our ICT dialogue today. A special word of welcome to our uh, newly appointed MEC for Economic Development for Gauteng and former Deputy Minister of COCTA, Mr. Park Stau. Please also allow me to welcome all of you. As I, as, uh, as I indicated earlier, I do not work alone. So I would like to hand it over to Prof. Berry right now. Thank you so much, Tabang, and welcome everyone, and welcome to our new Gauteng MEC and ex-minister, Parks Tau, and welcome to our panelists and our audience. Um, Parks Tau, or to put his formal, his complete name, in fact, is Mpo Franklin Parks Tau, um, was the minister, as we've heard, of um, was the deputy minister in the in in uh, the department of cooperative government and traditional affairs, and we were very excited this week to hear that he's coming back to Gauteng as the um, head of economic development. Uh, Parks um, studied at um, uh, the well. He uh, firstly studied uh, public management at the Regenesis Business School, and then he went on to earn a master's degree in public policy and management from the University of London. He spent more than 20 years in local government, including being the executive mayor of the city of Johannesburg. He's been president of SALGA, the South African Local Government Association. 
He's been president or might still be president of the um, of a very important organization called uh, United um, uh, Cities and Local Governments. And he's a member of the World Resource Institutes and Coalition for Urban Transition. He um, certainly is a um, key person in terms of um, looking at how local government can support uh, the growth and the growth of the internet. So if I can um, can uh, um, uh, welcome uh, uh, Park Star um, and please ask him to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you very much. Prof and to all the colleagues that are on the platform. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this important conversation. I can imagine that you had invited national government and overnight it suddenly became the provincial government that came here. Um, and even I've had to adapt my input from that of uh, primarily focusing on the work done by national government particularly COCTA, to being a bit more pragmatic about some of the real life experiences of the work that uh, one has been part of uh, in addressing issues of the digital divide and ensuring that we can broaden access to the internet in South Africa. But before I even do that, I thought it would be important to reflect somewhat on some of the issues that national government has been working on. The Department of Cooperative Governance has, is on the verge of presenting um, an overarching framework for smart cities uh, together with an implementation plan. This is work that we have been doing in that department together with the CSIR as our technical partners. In platform from which uh, we can be able to reap socio-economic dividends by deploying public assets in a manner that uh, address issues of the digital divide and ensures internet access to communities in South Africa. So I think that for all stakeholders it would be important <clears throat> to keep our eye on that work that's been concluded by COCTA together with the CSIR and contribute to ensuring that it is able to, to be enhanced by all practitioners and role players in this space. Internet con connectivity must become a core service to municipalities, I believe, and in many ways has been recognized as part of um, uh, public services that need to be provided by, um, or rather a right that needs to be accessed and therefore the responsibility of public institutions to ensure access to public services such as the internet. It now ranks alongside water, electricity and other services as part of the public good that needs to be provided to our citizens. And indeed we must do this well because it is key to reducing not just digital inequality, but inequality in general. I say this, colleagues, because the internet exists to unlock the ultimate potential and creativity of South African society and the world in general. We must ensure that access to the internet is a guaranteed right and that municipalities play a central role in affirming this right and access uh, and ensure access to citizens. We welcome this initiative by the by Virtual University through the Johannesburg Center for Software Engineering in partnership with EE Business Intelligence and NetBank to host this dialogue. Colleagues, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the importance of connectivity. As it has elucidated the enormous digital divide in South Africa, 
We've seen schools and universities move online and many students left behind because they cannot afford access to reliable internet connectivity. Many companies have made the move to online remote working. Again, thousands of employees have been disadvantaged, having to pay for expensive in internet connections at home, and many of, the, of these in jobs that do, cannot be accessed through internet connectivity and thus losing their jobs. Local government therefore has a critical role to play in the rollout of broadband infrastructure, most importantly for, mile, for last mile connections, bringing internet connections directly into homes and into businesses. We've made some important progress in the rollout of internet connectivity. In 2017, according to a study conducted by Worldwide Works, the South African internet user population passed the 20 million mark for the first time but affordability remains a major challenge. Now, I thought I should say, as I said, I should share, as I said earlier, direct anecdotes of roles that local government can play, and I'm sure Alan would share some of his experiences in this regard, but I'll share some of the experiences and anecdotes of the work that we did in the city of Johannesburg, and I believe we should be able to build on and ensure that uh, we learn from other cities as we build on the work, on the pioneering work that has been done by some of the cities and towns in our country. Now, now part of the initiatives was through the development of the Joburg Broadband Program, which was intended to ensure that we can broaden access, both in terms of infra infrastructure penetration and costs. In this regard, Johannesburg has relaunched the Johannesburg Free Wi-Fi Hotspot Program, which had been delayed for some time. But implementation included, amongst others, ensuring that we are able to build a Wi-Fi mesh over the Bramfontein precinct, particularly because that's the university precinct in, our, in, in the city of Johannesburg, but also ensuring access to Wi-Fi hotspots in public spaces. Currently, there are 84 active free Wi-Fi hotspots across the city. Many of these revived recently. Um, and these hotspots that are already active across the city are being accessed by up to 6,000 devices. And future enhancements include the implementation of analytics, which will ensure insightful reporting on the use of the hotspots. What is significant about this program is that it is in fact run through hotspots that uh, are solar powered. And I'm sure Prof. Berry would refer to, to an experience of where, or, to, or rather to the experience of where this lesson came from. Because indeed, in partnership with the Tsimulukong Digital Innovation Precinct in Bramfontein launched in 2016, one of the pilot sites that had been identified or successful uh, initiatives that had been ident identified for support would have been solar run Wi-Fi hotspots in the city of Johannesburg. Spearheaded together with the, the JCSE would have been a partnership not just with government but also with civil society. And today the precinct is home to entrepreneurs, coda startups and thriving ecosystem of tech businesses. At the same time, IBM opened its school, its second research location in Africa with an IPM research lab located in the precinct. The lab houses IPM's Watson supercomputer that combines artificial intelligence and sophisticated analytic software for optimal performance as a question answering machine. Now this is but just one demonstration of a partnership successfully initiated between uh, the private sector together with um, the university uh, and indeed the public sector in the city in this regard that we should be able to build on and replicate throughout the country. Of course, adapting to different conditions that we experience in different locations. The Josie Ambassadors, the Digital Ambassadors Program rather is another example of a program that sought to address the issue of the internet divide. The role of the Josie Digital Ambassador was to train first-time internet users on how to access the city's free Wi-Fi, but also how, how to make use of online services. In essence, 
The intention was to say, it is not just about gaining access, it is also about optimizing the utilization of the resource that is the internet. So creating digital literacy is as important as, it, as uh, creating access to infrastructure and support systems that have been identified. And another example that I thought I should relate to is one that you find in a rural area as part of the examples that we can build on. Now, Mankos is a, is a remote rural community in South Africa's Eastern Cape province. It is home to almost 6,000 people, and the nearest city is Mtata, which is about 60 kilometers away. And a research team at the University of the Western Cape has worked with residents to develop a solar-powered wireless community network. The Zenzeleni network project, which, and Zenzeleni means do it yourself, is this initiative that we're talking about. Is, is another initiative that we're talking about. This is South Africa's first and only internet service provider, or rather it's the, it's the one that we're talking about. Sorry about that. This is South Africa's first and only internet service provider that is owned and run by a rural cooperative, thus empowering citizens as partners in the rollout of the internet and ensuring that rural communities are able to be partners in the rollout process and it is not seen, so to say, as an endeavor of the, of the urban spaces, an endeavor of those who have access um, to uh, uh, infrastructure in urban centers. The last other program I thought I should refer to is an initiative that was undertaken to pilot and kickstart massive open online varsities by a, a city in partnership with academic institutions to ensure that we can be able to create access to those young people that are unable to access university education to, to free open on, online varsity programs and kickstart their participation, not just in terms of digital access, but also improving their skills and capabilities. So I thought, Prof, it would be important that we look at these as examples of what can be done and collate these with a number of other initiatives that have been created in the country, which then lays the basis for us to almost mesh these into a consolidated program of ensuring digital access, leveraging from the assets that we already have, but also leveraging from the experiences that we already have in growing uh, opportunities in the country. On that note, I'd like to thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this platform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, I don't know what to say, Deputy Minister or MEC, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tau, for the intriguing and informative um, address you've just given us. Um, uh, it is very interesting and obviously also encouraging to hear about the initiatives you had, um, have mentioned um, that are happening across the country, especially in our rural areas. Yes, um, well, I think uh, it's time then to move on. Uh, thank you again, as I said. Um, it's my time now to introduce uh, the next speaker, which is uh, Mr. Alan Not Craig Jr. Um, Alan Not Craig is a successful entrepreneur, um, best selling author, and founder of Project Isiizwe, which means the nation, an NGO that advocates for affordable internet for all. He is also the founder of the Herotel, a broadband operator operating throughout South Africa. He studied at Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, formerly the UPE, and qualified as a chartered accountant with Jet, uh, Deloitte in 2002. So between 2003 and 2017, he has uh, co-founded and uh, uh, funded 27 companies in the technology and media telecommunication sector in Africa, including CellFind, iFind34600, um, Tudo, the uh, Daily Maverick, Pondering Panda, uh, Inaku, um, Trebage, Avo Chok, and Namola. He has uh, published 
nine books since two, uh, 2008, including a national bestseller called Don't Panic and a global history of uh, telecommunications. Um, Mr. Alan Notcraig, Junior, the platform is yours. Over to you. <clears throat> thank you, Tabang. Uh, thank you, Barry, for the invitation. Mr. Tao, it's nice to hear your voice again and see the video of you again. It's been a long time since I saw you. Um, so I, I've been asked to you know, give uh, some of the lessons learned on the journey of Isizwe, particularly in Chwani, Chwani Wi-Fi. Um, and there are lots of lessons learned out of that, so I'll, I'll take you through that in detail now, but um, maybe just to give it a little bit of background. Uh, I think to what Mr. Tao was saying a bit earlier, uh, it dawned on me about 10 years ago that that there's just so much inequality in South Africa. Um, and the, the one that frustrates me the most is uh, the fact that my kids have got a great, um, have got great internet access. And then, but they've also got a great uh, great school and they've got books at home, et cetera. And yet kids down the road in a place like Kaimandi don't have a great school necessarily compared to my school uh, and, and the books aren't as many as our books. And, and yet they also don't have internet access. So, you know, it just compounds the fact that the opportunity, the, the playing field's not, not level for opportunity. And so for the last 10 years or so, I've been kind of focused on trying to figure out how do you, how do you give everybody equal access to the internet? And not for the purposes of making everyone equal, uh, just for the purpose of those kids out there that, or and adults that want to get ahead, um, and if they had the internet, they would be able to. So um, I was a part of Mixit for a while, uh, for those of you who remember Mixit. And then in 2013, uh, I started an, a non-profit organization called Project Isizwe, and the idea was we would try and convince uh, the government to, to basically subsidize the internet. The way, um, the, the, probably one of the best uh, analogies is roads. So if, if you look at a like a city like um, Chwani, you've got a, a township, um, Mamalodi, and you've got the eastern suburbs. Um, and the eastern suburbs are generating a lot of tax revenue, but the township's not. But that doesn't mean there's dirt roads in the township. You know, you have, you have tar roads in the township, and then everyone kind of understands that the city works on the basis that everyone needs roads. Just because you're not paying taxes doesn't mean you don't get a road. And I started thinking about the internet like that, saying, you know, just because you, you you know you're living in an area that um, you know Shoshengove or Mamalodi, you should uh, you shouldn't be denied access to the internet. So um, after a few false starts in the Cape, I was introduced to the the then executive mayor of Chwani, Kosienzo Ramakhopa, and he bought in, he, you know it resonated with him this idea that municipalities could get into the game of providing internet as a utility. And so we um, we started something called the Twenty Free Wi-Fi Project in 2013, and I remember a lot of people said it's the dumbest idea they ever heard. Mostly dumb because I was trying to deal with the government, which uh, you know it's it's not easy working with the government, but it was extremely rewarding. It was an extremely rewarding experience because um, I finally learned that you know I learned what scale means, and it's and it's virtually impossible to operate at proper scale without working with the government, in particular local, local government. I mean, local government is where the, the rubber hits the road. And, uh, and you know, somebody did the numbers the other day um, and 20 free Wi-Fi has now connected over 5 million devices in the last seven years. I mean, it's 5 million, 5 million people's lives have been touched by a project run by the municipality. Now, um, 20 Wi-Fi, you know, ultimately, and I, I think it still is the biggest uh, municipal Wi-Fi network on the continent. Um, it's totally free, so the idea is you can just go to, uh, you know, you should be able to walk from your house to a public Wi-Fi zone and and just go go on the internet. It's not like uh, always on, which is always off. It's got it's more it's more user friendly, so there's no funny uh, login details or anything, and it's it's kind of just fast. Um, but but we did uh, certainly run into a couple of uh, stumbling blocks. I mean, if I hadn't had partners who could kind of bankroll this process and uh, and take a lot of risk, uh, we couldn't have done it because you know the government procurement process is so um, it's just so difficult that it's you have to you have to take an enormous amount of risk before you can uh, ever get paid, and even then there's like risk that you you're not going to get paid. Um, but ultimately, the, the real risk was political risk because uh, I don't know if you guys know, but in 2016, uh, the DA actually took over Chwani. And then the first thing they wanted to do was kill the Wi-Fi 
because the the Wi-Fi was called Sputler Wi-Fi, you know, and Sputler was the previous mayor, and they didn't want him to be famous. So, you know, a political decision became more important than what's right for the the city, and then they try to kill it, and ultimately they ended up putting it out in tender, and, and another organization took it over, and it's still running. But for me, the experience was like, geez, this is hectic, game. Yeah. I mean, this is the 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 politics of life. I mean, I'm not complaining about it. It's just what it is. But if you expose yourself to the vagaries of true politics, you, you, you know, it's not necessarily the most sustainable thing. And the second thing that wasn't sustainable about it was ultimately you relied on the government subsidy. So, you know, if the government has a bad year, um, then you might lose the subsidy and people lose the internet. So um, we migrated, Project DCs were then migrated towards corporate South Africa, and we started getting projects going with big, blue chip companies, one of which was Glencore, uh, the world's biggest mining company. And they had a lot of coal mining communities in Pumalanga that they wanted to provide internet to. So they did it on the same basis that Twani did. Uh, they basically picked up the tab on behalf of the community and the CISBA rolled it out and it worked great. Uh, but the one difference was it's not at scale, you know, because you're not working with a muni, you're actually working with like a little company. It's a great company, but you know, you can't get to 5 million people. And secondly, um, it is still charity. You know, the way they considered it as charity. Luckily, they've been, they love it and they keep going and they're a big company, but there's always this risk that the CEO one change one day changes or there's a global recession or something and, and you just lose that, you lose it because it's, it's not driven by profit. So um, about a year ago, uh, we actually started uh, um, thinking about how to make it profitable, but without making it unaffordable. And I think that's the most important thing to realize about internet access in South Africa is, is the problem is not that there is no internet. There is actually internet everywhere. I mean, I was in Toyoyandu about three weeks ago and it's the far northeast of Lumpopo. And it's, um, it's 3G, 4G, it's it's all over there. The The problem is it costs you too much money to use it. So if, you, if you're you know, using it literally all the time for online learning videos or, or Netflix or music videos or anything, um, you're just sucking your, your airtime dry and it, it's just too expensive. So, so whilst we were always committed to this kind of concept of free, we, we decided to maybe take a step outside of our dogma and go towards cheap. So we came up with a, a five rand per day model. So we kind of thought, well, maybe, maybe if we sold 24 hours of internet for five rand, maybe that's firstly affordable. And secondly, maybe we can make a profit out of that. And actually, funny enough, it's worked out. So uh, for the past year, we've been running projects in uh, Kwamashu, townships outside of Durban, uh, and it's kind of making a decent profit. Um, and then, uh, and then we, and then we did a project with the Rambuda tribe um, in Toyandu. They've got about 150,000 members, about 30,000 homes, and in the next six months, every one of those homes, yeah, that's like 150,000 people are going to be within walking distance of five rand Wi-Fi. So not free Wi-Fi, but five rand Wi-Fi. Uh, and the magic of that whole setup is we create a special purpose vehicle that is a PTY limited that the tribe owned the community, the, the tribal trust owns 70% and which means the assets are actually held within that PTY. So, you know, when, when you're living in that community, you're not thinking to yourself, oh, well, that base station over there is owned by Vodacom and that's owned by somebody in London, so we don't care. In fact, that infrastructure that's sitting over there that's providing us Wi-Fi, it's actually our infrastructure. So, you know, firstly, let's protect it. And secondly, let's use it because 70% of the profits that come out of that um, Wi-Fi network come towards the community, which the community can then use to either roll out more Wi-Fi or build schools or whatever it was to do. So it was the first little magic uh, secret source that we figured out. And the second one was, um, how to fund those things. So you still need a bit of money to roll out these networks up front. And we originally thought maybe it's similar to what we did in Chwani where, where you get a big a big brother or big sister like Chwani or Glencore to lend you the money and then you pay back that money out of profits. But we've actually come up with a fantastic model now um, which is basically just offtake agreements. So we, we build infrastructure in communities but, but we get offtake agreements from local employers or schools. So for example, say a Glencore, instead of lending us 5 million rand to roll out a network, they could just give us a contract saying they'll buy, you know, 50,000 5 rand vouchers a month, which they then distribute to their employees and their families. And on the back of that 250,000 rand a month contract, we can take that to a bank and we can borrow money and we use that money to, to roll out the network. So, you know, our evolution um, 
we've evolved massively. Um, Cizwe is actually no longer even a, for, a, a non-profit. We've just realized just make this a for-profit. Then you get away from this the kind of ego-driven charity stuff and all the risks that come with it. It becomes completely sustainable. And, and now you've actually got a situation where we can roll out affordable internet um, without relying on a government subsidy. And so whilst whilst it was a fantastic experience at the city of Chwani, um, you know, I don't think I'd ever want to go through government procurement again. I'm sure Mr. Tao agrees it's not the most fun thing in the whole world. But still, at the end of the day, you have to work with the government. And I think our model now is such a model that you, you're kind of working hand in glove with local government, but you're not needing their money. And perhaps that's the that's a that's one of the options for kind of scaling affordable internet infrastructure. And I think it's now over to Barry. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, and it it uh, kind of confirms something that I know very well, and that is that a project has to be sustainable. You can't provide something that becomes um, a basic need on the uh, basis of charity or handouts or a tap that can be turned off. So I think internet to me is an essential service and it has to be a sustainable model. And I'm very excited to hear about the uh, progress that you've made in moving this um, forward. Uh, we are now joined by one of my colleagues from WITS, Professor Brian Armstrong. And uh, Brian is one of the foremost uh, leaders in the South African ICT sector. He's got over 30 years of top level um, leadership and managerial experience in telecommunications, in IT, technology R&D, and in systems engineering, both here in South Africa and abroad. He's currently professor and chair of uh, digital business at the Witts Business School. He's also non-executive director at the uh, company Old Mutual, and he's also um, a non-executive uh, director at the Huge Group. Uh, he previously spent um, seven years in Telcom as the Group Chief Operating Officer and the Group Chief Commercial Officer. And he as well was at BT as the Vice President for Middle East and Africa. I'm proud to say that he completed his, both his BSc and MSc at WITS in the same school that I'm in, the School of Electrical Engineering. And he obtained a PhD from University College in London, where my daughter is now studying. So we've got a lot in common, Brian. Um, at, and now if I can hand over to Brian, who will um, um, kind of share some of his insights with us. Thank you, Brian. Excellent. Thank you, Barry. And uh, good morning, afternoon to everybody, uh, to all my fellow panelists and to everybody that's on this webinar. Barry, I think another thing we have in common is that we share a passion for making sure that broadband is made accessible to, to all South Africans. And that's what I want to share some thoughts with you today in terms of some work I've done to see which is the right technology and what sort of interventions can work the best. So I'm going to be talking about enhancing broadband access in South Africa. So I'm going into full screen mode now. And I think what I'm going to be talking about is firstly, the technology choices we make are very important. They, the technology choices impact on the addressable market. And indeed the addressable market has feedback into what technology choices should be made. Both of the size of the addressable market and the tech choices impact on the commercial viability of what we're proposing. And what we of course looking at today is state participation and how government, and in today's case, particularly local government, can help move this forward. So I'm going to touch on each four of these things and let me start with the technology choices. I think the important point to make is when we talk about broadband and particularly focusing here on residential broadband, is that there is no one size fits all solution. Broadband is very much a case of different horses for different courses. That the, the technology that is appropriate for a high rise in Santon may not be appropriate for a block in Alexandra, um, literally two kilometers away. Uh, they might need very different technology choices. 
And what this slide shows is essentially the menu of options that we can think about when we want to deploy technology. Obviously, there's at the top of it, there's the fiber to the home or fiber to the premise with three variants of underground aerial and fiber to the basement um, in the case of multi-dwelling units. Then there's a range of what I would call wireless last quarter mile solutions. So this is new technologies, what I call spotlight Wi-Fi. So essentially this use specialized Wi-Fi with beamforming technology to take it into the home, or you can have floodlight Wi-Fi or community Wi-Fi of the nature that Alan was talking about. Then of course, there's a number of point-to-point -point wireless solutions. They can also, also be point-to-multipoint. And satellite is always in the wings and particularly with the emergence of future low earth orbit satellite constellations, we shouldn't write off satellite as a particular niche solution. And of course, 4G and 5G uh, is a very important contributor. And as you can see, each one of these has a particular profile of quality of what it can deliver and cost in terms of what it costs to deploy and therefore the common use cases that emerge. Now, the question is where do these different technologies fit in terms of the South African socio-economic landscape? And to address that, what I've um, looked at and I'll be sharing with you is looking at South Africa in, in terms of this relatively simple matrix. So what you see on this is across the horizontal axis, you see the density of homes ranging from deep rural where there's less than eight homes per square kilometer ranging to the most dense urban areas and typically are often informal settlements and so on, uh, where you can have more than 2,500 dwellings per square kilometer. That's that axis. On the vertical axis, you see the household income per month, uh, obviously ranging from uh, people that aren't earning much at all or households that aren't earning much at all to very affluent households at the bottom of the table. And the number that you see in each cell is the number of dwellings in South Africa according to Stats, 20, Stats SA 2018 data. And you will see there are 16.9 million homes in South Africa. And th this number represents the number of homes that we see. Now the point is, what sorts of technology are applicable where? And I'm going to be showing you the answer essentially. And then in the next few minutes, I'll tell you how I got to that answer. And Public Wi-Fi and various Wi-Fi solutions work very well in dense areas and they are particularly important in lower income communities. Fiber to the home, on the other hand, because it's expensive to deploy uh, and it is more expensive to deploy in if, if the density is less, um, is really applicable in this bottom right hand corner of, of this map. If you use wireless last quarter mile solutions, you can extend the, the, the coverage into slightly less dense areas. Satellite is very useful in affluent deep rural areas where it is very expensive to deploy fiber. And then of course you have 4G and 5G, which cover huge amounts of South Africa. And as, as particularly as uh, Wi-Fi networks get further deployed as 5G becomes prevalent, as new spectrum gets um, awarded and the service and there's more bandwidth available to satisfy the levels of demand, 5G and 4G will be very important parts of the equation. This, for example, is not to say that Wi-Fi cannot work in high income areas. It's just that fiber to the home is a preferential product and these folks can afford it and therefore the commercial viability is is essentially how this diagram suggests. There's a very important point to make about this and you'll see this area here, the top row and the leftmost row and maybe even the top two rows of this. Um, there is still no answer to that from what my research has shown in terms of, of a commercially viable and sustainable solution for addressing uh, broadband access to the poorest people in South Africa outside of geographic areas of high density. And that still needs work and we still collectively need to find what the right answer is there. Now, if I say that these are the various types of technology that are appropriate for different parts of the South African socioeconomic landscape, how big is the addressable market for these? And essentially, 
the addressable market is a function of five key variables. It is a function of the type of dwelling. It is a function of where those dwellings are. It is a function of the spatial density of the dwellings. It is a function of what residents can afford and therefore their income. And it is a function indeed of what already exists because you would not take new infrastructure build where there is already existing infrastructure. And if we look at fiber as an example, what we see when we go through these five, five filters is typically fiber is deployed to primary formal structures, flats, townhouses, and clusters and gated communities. That's where the operators and the ISPs essentially take fiber. It doesn't, the secondary dwelling would normally piggyback off the primary dwelling. And the lack of tenure or durability of many an informal dwelling is not seen to warrant the, um, the deployment of fiber as an example. Then the second question is, where is it? And thus far, the network operators have focused on the main metros, the secondary metros, and the large towns and the affluent smaller towns. Um, the, the, the challenge, the scale challenges, as well as the um, associated costs of getting backhaul and uh, facilitating in infrastructure in place uh, in the other environments has proved problematic. And the focus has been on the main town, main metro, secondary metros, and larger towns and affluent smaller ones. As I mentioned earlier, fiber gets very expensive if you have to deploy a lot of fiber per home. So it is more applicable to high, very high and high density areas. Uh, it unfortunately, and I'll talk more about this later, there is a minimum viable price. Um, so it is really um, suitable for more affluent areas. And if you want to become a fiber, if you want to get into the fiber market now, you will not go and deploy fiber where Vumatel or Metro Fiber or Frogfoot or OpenServe or any of the existing fiber operators have, had, have already deployed. Overbuild or duplicating infrastructure is not only uh, wasteful, it's also commercially uh, very difficult to get right. So when we then apply these five filters, let's just see, so what, what we see is that if this is the, the fiber set, the, the, the set of parameters for fiber, we see that there are of the 16.9 million dwellings in South Africa, 12 million are primary formal structures, flats, townhouses, clusters, or gated communities. Of what those 12 million, only 7 million are in main metros, secondary metros, or large towns, or affluent smaller towns. Of which only 5 million are in high or very high density areas, of which 3.5 million can afford it, of which only one and a half million have not yet been by the end of this year. By the end of this year or during the middle of next year, it will be about two million unique homes that will have been passed by fiber already. So that is essentially a way of looking at the at the addressable market for fiber. But now, now I, I mentioned um, the third issue, which is commercial viability. So if we want to now invest in fiber, of course, we need to make sure that the project is viable. And to assess this, is what we need to make sure is that the industry ecosystem is viable. And the industry ecosystem, I'm going to go through it very quickly. Of course, there's consumers. They are served by the retailers or the ISPs, uh, who in turn get services from value-added service providers or the over-the-top players, who sometimes um, obviously go directly to consumers. The retailers get their network from the network operator, sometimes the gated community or the landlord of um, commercial property gets involved. Um, and obviously the network operators back off to the big wholesale backhaul players and um, aggregation providers. And the network operators also get the equipment from the, um, the likes of, you know, the, the equipment vendors um, who usually now deliver through turnkey um, vendors. So this is essentially the ecosystem, but what's important is that it's this value chain that has to be sustainable. And if the assumption is that the equipment vendors essentially sell their, their, their kit at a price that is sustainable, and they essentially then sort of dust their hands and walk away, the critical value chain that has to be sustainable is this one. And the subsequent analysis that I'm going to show is what is the break-even selling price that you need to sell for this value chain to be sustainable? The analysis looks at the uptake, the length of the street fiber and the cost of fiber per meter as the key inputs and finds the break even price for that value chain. This is the break even retail price for the value chain 
to to be sustainable. And there's a whole lot of secondary variables that go into it, which aren't aren't important for now. The outcome of this analysis is a whole lot of graphs that essentially look like this. So this is an example. If, if you have to deploy 18 meters of fiber per home past, which by the way corresponds to about 700 homes per square kilometer, if you want to break even as a fiber player, you say, I want my discounted cash flow to get back to zero in month 120, which is pretty um, aggressive, let's say, um, and you work on that, there'll be 40% uptake. Then what you see here is the essentially the top, this top blue line is the is the cumulative cost over those 120 months. The red line is the cumulative revenue, and each one of these bars is the outcome of a dis discounted cash flow analysis based on the price you see, 99 rand a month or 199 rand a month. And what you can discern from this is that in this particular scenario, the break-even retail price is 407 rand a month. So 407 rand a month if you deploy 18 meters of fiber um, per home, you're looking for break-even after 120 months and you've got 40% uptake. You do this several times and you can see if you do it at 25 meters of home, then your break-even price is 511. And if on the other hand, you only need 13 meters of fiber per home, your break-even price is 334. So there's a few key things that come out of this. Network CapEx isn't always the dominant cost driver. We see that the ISP revenue share and the interest can be very significant. Um, and it looks from this initial analysis that a price of a retail price of about 300 rand a month isn't achievable without subsidies, even in very high density places, unless you work on a very um, high uptake. If you run this DCF model many, many, many times for a whole lot of different scenarios, you get a very interesting answer. Um, and that is that the break-even price is essentially a function of the length of length. L is the length of fiber that you have to deploy per home, street fiber. U is the uptake. So for example, this number being 50 is 10 meters of home with a 20% uptake or 20 meters of ho per home with a 40% uptake. If you say you get it down to this very dense area, 6.7 meters of fiber per home at a 40% uptake or 10 meters, you see there's this incredible, this answer actually took me aback, but essentially you see this price curve. We Now that we have this price curve, we can plug it into our density models and come up with the uh, affordability of fiber in South Africa. And now you remember this chart here, 16.9 million homes in South Africa with a number of homes per area. Um, if we then use these break-even prices, what you see here is that essentially there are 4.7 million homes that can be, that it will be commercially viable for network operators to build, that they have a reasonable chance of being achieving a break-even situation after 10 years. And you can see the, the this heat map of where those areas are located. And this sort of justifies the triangle that I showed on the opening slide. This, however, is for all homes, not only primary formal structures, and it's in all parts of South Africa with no filtering of primary um, metros and secondary metros. If we say that we um, only want to take it into, formal, into primary formal structures, but still for the whole of South Africa, that number falls to 4.4 million. And if we say we're actually going to look at it where the ISPs and the network operators are currently building out with those three um, uh, geotypes, there we come back to that number of about 3.6 million homes are addressable by fiber. Okay, so much for fiber. Let's look at the other one, which is Wi-Fi. And if we say that, um, we, let's, let's take a typical Wi-Fi hotspot deployment. If we go to some sort of uh, small, town's uh, residential area, and we say we're going to deploy Wi-Fi, um, and typically you would say, let's go and we'll deploy five access points per, per cluster. So you deploy this cluster of five access points, which looks like this. Here you can see all the assumptions for your later reference. I'm not going to go through it. And we do a similar analysis to the one we did. So on the vertical axis here, you see the cumulative cost um, per paying subscriber, per paying customer, um, over, in this case, because it's Wi-Fi, it's not buried infrastructure, 36-month period, um, you can see we can get a break-even ARPU 
per paying customer of 58 rand. If the um, if fewer people adopt the service and you have a smaller percent of paying customers, the ARPU that they need to pay goes up to 100 rand. And obviously, if you can get more paying customers, uh, the ARPU per paying customer goes down to about 37 rand. So what we see here is again, network capex is 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 in many cases not the dominant driver. Other value chain costs like the Wi-Fi entrepreneur or the Wisp OPEX, uh, Wisp is the Wi-Fi uh, Wi-Fi ISP. Um, they become very significant parts of the of the cumulative cost structure. And but it does seem that ARPUs of about 50 rand a month seem to be sustainable. The challenge, of course, as I'm sure Alan would agree, is how you generate 50 rand ARPUs from a significant number of the population in the poorest parts of South African society. And that's where ad funded models, sponsored models, hosted um, public Wi-Fi models are important parts of the equation. And again, if you were to generalize this running countless scenarios, you end up with a situation that says your Wi-Fi break even ARPU is also a function of essentially what this horizontal axis is the capex per paying customer. So that's your network capex, the total capex after any subsidies you might get, divided by the number of paying, um, the number of homes covered uh, multiplied by the uptake. Um, and if then we end up with this um, slide, which shows the viable addressable market that is that is um, that is sustainable and can break even. So what you see is Wi-Fi can provide significant uh, complementary coverage relative to fiber. What you see in the bottom chart here is the um, the penetration that is potentially um, economically sustainable. And you'll see as we move to the left, it starts falling off and becoming less sustainable as the density um, goes down. The final point I'd like to cover very briefly is so how should and can the state um, help here? And I start from the position that says we avoiding the two extremes of essentially a state run economy where the state does everything or a laissez faire market economy where the state does nothing. Um, and that really the route in for, for the state and it's a, and, and I'm not used to saying this um, cynically. There are two practical categories of market failure. It's where there's inefficient competition resulting in high prices and poor quality, which we have seen historically in broadband in South Africa. I think um, we're on the right path there. And the other and the more important one here is where there's undemonstrated demand, which leads to insufficient investment, slow and disappointing deployment, uh, because the return cycle by, is, is not aligned with investor expectations. When I mentioned 120 month payback on the fiber model, I'm sure some people gasped and said, I'm not putting my money into something that's going to take 120 months. That then leads us to, if I look around the world and see how has government really got involved, there are three key areas we need to discuss. The first is, what is the time dimension? Is government going to get involved and participate in perpetuity by setting up a structure and operating that in perpetuity? Or is it to get involved as in a sort of a Kickstarter mode to get things moving, uh, but then it's clearly important that there's an exit strategy. What is true is that around the world, most of the state interventions in broadband infrastructure deployment are, are transient. There are a few like the Australian NGN and one or two others um, which are in perpetuity. The second is what is the funding model? Is the government prepared to see this as an expense? That is, is they're going to put in X billion rand per year uh, forever and it's gone? Or is it an investment that at some point they will get their money back or some other return? Or could it just be a, some form of guarantee? And I think in South Africa, the, the fiscal context really inhibits a material fiscal expense. I don't think there's another 5 billion or 20 billion rand per year that can be in the wings to keep this running. Um, and the departure point that I then come from is that ultimately, whether it's a public-private partnership or state entity or private entity, ultimately post the intervention, whether it's an upfront subsidy or whatever, the entity needs to be commercially viable. And then the mode of involvement, obviously government has and does get involved through legislation, regulation and being the licensor. It can and get involved with incentives and subsidies. It can get involved in the form of some special purpose vehicles uh, in public private partnerships. It can set up special purpose vehicles or use state owned enterprises to participate directly. Um, very importantly, 
government can be an anchor customer and being the progressive early adopter to demonstrate demand and get the industry ac across the chasm. And it is a very important role in, in providing the facilitating conditions. So that's the use of street furniture. It is um, at the other extreme uh, it, levels of educational and uh, digital literacy that society uh, demonstrates high demand. And I think it's important to say that at a local government level, there's limited opportunity, obviously, with regard to legislation and regulation. Um, the, in South Africa, the idea of incentives and subsidies has been underused, but it is on the radar in the presidential recovery plan. Public-private partnerships around the world, interestingly, the most common manifestation is keeping a share of their telco, the listed telco. Um, that's still quite common. Um, direct participation, um, the issue is the funding requirements. Where is two or 10 or 20 billion rand going to come from? In my opinion, being a progressive adopter is a critical role for government to play. And thus far, I think they haven't played that role as well as they could have. And similarly, um, providing the facilitating conditions is also essential. And again, government's contribution here hasn't been what it could be with regard to way leave, street furniture, um, uh, education levels, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to focus now on the subsidies. Last two slides. Um, three, three modes of subsidies that I looked at was you can apply a subsidy at a network build level, you can apply a connection subsidy to the ISP, or you can provide a direct consumer subsidy through some form of vouchers, not necessarily administered directly to the consumer. And what we see in this, if I use this in the previous model, is that we see that in South Africa, this is now with fiber, impact of subsidies with fiber. If you were to give a, a subsidy of say 5,000 Rand, what you see is that you can increase the coverage by between 800,000 and 1 million homes. So call it a million homes. If you to take it to 10,000 subsidy per home on the network build, you get that up to 1.2 million. On the other side, if you provide a direct subsidy to the consumer, you get much more bang for your buck in terms of the impact of the commercial viability of the network um, by the application of subsidies. The challenge with a consumer subsidy is it's uh, what happens when you remove the consumer subsidy after say 12 months or 24 months, which leads us into the middle, which is essentially a connection subsidy. And the, the short answer is if you're applying the, the subsidy, the, the interesting thing is this shows the number of the incremental homes that become commercially viable. And we see that the place the subsidy works best is on the fringes of where network operators would otherwise go. In other words, it's not quite viable for them to go, but if you apply a subsidy, it becomes viable. Having done the same for um, Wi-Fi, we see that depending on the size of the subsidy per cluster that I showed, you can increase the level of um, coverage by a million, again, a million homes. So applying these together, subsidies can certainly uh, make it commercially viable to attract or to cover another one million, maybe one and a half million homes with fiber and another one to one and a half million homes with um, with Wi-Fi, which starts getting towards um, a more, let's not call it universal, but makes a significant contribution to universal coverage in South Africa. So I think in, in a nutshell, Courses for courses, it's not one technology solution fits all. Um, and the, I believe there is a role for the state to play to address the market failure that there's untested demand and the investment cycles are misaligned. And subsidies are one of the mechanisms where government can play a role. But if you ask me, they should really be the lead aggressive um, adopter to actually create demand. Um, with that, thank you very much. And I'm going to hand back to Tabang. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, Armstrong. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Indeed, uh, some guidelines there for us to to can ponder on and for government to also take note of. Um, I, would, I wish uh, to just uh, um, remind the um, panel, I mean, uh, attendants of this webinar that uh, you are feel free to send your questions through. And as you send the questions, do say to whom you are addressing the question so we can be able to uh, send it appropriately. 
Um, also, just to mention that the, um, the MEC has had to drop off now because he's got another engagement at one o'clock, which is exactly now. So we thank him for his attendance and his address earlier. And uh, the same as uh, Alan, he also had to um, drop off as they are uh, in other engagements. But we thank them for giving us their moment. Um, so the next uh, speaker um, is last, uh, but by no means least, um, is uh, the rose among the thorns, uh, um, is Catherine uh, Kaufman, um, who is the head of infrastructure, water and telecoms um, at NetBank Corporate and Investment Bank, CIB. She is primarily responsible for uh, determining and executing business strategy and growing NetBank CIB's investment footprint in South Africa and the rest of Africa. Um, she qualified in law at the University of Redwaterstrand and is an attorney and project finance investment uh, banker with more than 20 years of experience in legal, commercial and financial services. Well, we are hearing and we are looking forward to hearing from you, Catherine, and the stage is yours. Catherine, you may want to. Yes, good, good. I was saying unmute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good. It's afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have not present. I've not I'm not providing a presentation as I explained to Professor Barry uh, a couple of days ago that um, I like these uh, presentations, especially for myself, to be more conversation orientated. But I want to first thank uh, the previous presenter, Brian. Your presentation is a Christmas gift come early for our investment committees and our credit committees. It, it, it basically captures every single touch point we would look at in order to decide whether we would um, invest in, in municipal ICT infrastructure or, or, or fiber networks in particular. So just to first provide you with context before we go into the actual model, um, funding model that's a, that we think might be appropriate for fiber networks, I think it's first important to understand that banks like investors fund into a certain contextual framework. Um, and very important for that um, discussion is that, first of all, we, we look at the telco infrastructure architecture as a whole. We see where that particular um, sector, as in FAB, FNOs fit into that. And, and to drill down further, once we decide that we are uh, happy with the the industry and overall uh, ecosystem of uh, uh, of a particular um, sector. We then look at that investment on a standalone basis. So that's generally how we look at it. And I think uh, Brian referred to it uh, in in his previous conversations as well. The second driver for us are obviously um, the regulatory framework and. And I'm going to focus a little bit on, on spectrum and the opportunity that brings to fiber. Um, and it's not that fiber networks were not re required before the, the big news, important news around uh, spectrum allocation. It was, it was always required, it was always in demand, it was always necessary, and, and, it, and remains a very important backbone for 5G. But I think what's important about spectrum and this is where government and, 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 and government keeping their side of the bargain becomes really important is what it means for um, the growth of fiber networks in, in the country, the pace at which they accelerate and uh, alter, alternative networks that developed that de will develop as a consequence such as the um, uh, mobile virtual networks. So to start with the regulation itself, I think the biggest contribution is probably going to be from a financial perspective is what it will do to the fiscus having that uh, uh, auction and that and that and that funding come in. Very needed right now 
not only during COVID, but but even before that, very necessary. Um, secondly, I think what's been positive for me, and I'm going to maybe steer away from what uh, Brian said a little, although all he said was true, is that we have probably seen the most positive interaction between government and private sector in years in respect of infrastructure. Um, so, so I think what we need to 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 try and uh, sorry to interrupt, but there's a, a notice that we're on a comfort break. Are we in a comfort break? <laughs> OK, great. So um, I think what's important is is that um, we have seen and we've seen interaction at different levels of government. Um, Alan, um, I'm, I'm not sure if Alan's still on, but Alan would be familiar with the conversations um, uh, that have been had, especially by Alteron at the PPGI in the President's office, uh, which has laid the foundation for discourse within the industry and what's required from a policy perspective, but also the things that Brian alluded to, which is all the operational requirements that would reduce administrative time delays, um, and deploying other uh, telco in related infrastructure. Um, so I think that for us as a funder has been extremely positive. The industry came to the party and, and, and telcos dropped data prices at the start of lockdown. Um, following very constructive conversations with the Competition Commission. In addition, I think what what the delay has done has probably been felt most during COVID time. And once again, government um, did not delay. They released the, the emergency spectrum to allow the telcos to, to roll out um, uh, much needed um, data services to, to, to communities. But it's very, very clear that um, it comes a little bit late and it, it, it is it is quite important what we could have achieved if we had been ahead of the curve in spectrum be, being available prior to COVID. Still, I'm encouraged that there's a move away from confrontational uh, engagement to more, more cooperative engagement with uh, the, the, the private sector. I think the, the third element that we look at when we fund is obviously market dynamics. Um, and uh, in relation to fiber and, and, and spectrum, there's definitely an emergence of green shoots of alternative, uh, alternative revenue streams, telco operators, I say in apostrophes. Um, in terms of revenue streams, I think for a long time financial services, we don't even call it a, a disruption anymore. We see that as additional um, um, distribution channels for financial services, what, what's been happening in the telco operators, uh, what's been happening in, 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 in other MVNOs. And MVNOs, everybody's familiar on, 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 on the panel what that is, but really it's just where a particular MNO provides or lends, it, lends its network um, to a service provider. What, what Celsi did for Virgin Mobile and probably, I think, for Mr. Price. Um, so as a consequence of that, we see more activity coming ahead of us. And so what does it mean for um, fiber? So the the most obvious consequence, I think, is that despite the talks of of a vaccine, which is extremely encouraging, um, the rationale for funding into the sector remains. There will still be increased mobile traffic. Remote working is actually not gone permanently. In fact, we believe there will be versions of remote working going forward. E-education, e-medicine, cloud storage, and other di digital services will still be required. So there'll be a, a continued demand for rollout um, 
of fiber, especially to underserviced areas, to enable access to vital digital services. We also see that um, cheaper connectivity is required. And cheaper connectivity will, will, will not only be required, but will necessitate the work that needs to be done in previously underserviced areas to close the digital divide. Um, increase for fiber to the home as more people work from home. We've already seen that happening. And a demand and growth in, um, in fiber to legacy towers. So we foresee more open access players working together to avoid uh, asset duplication as was described earlier. And even in our funding models, we do not fund um, a, a borrower or a company or a business that is, you know, you, you, that, that has a, a business model that duplicates um, or lays cables adjacent to, to another, another FNO. The idea is to acquire or to lease or to roll out your own, but they all, the business model is, is, is one business model. Um, so to, to, to take us to our, the next part of the discussion, I think now we've established that that is our market, that is how we, that is how we approach a, a funding proposal. The most important one, probably the most exciting development for us, is that when Spectrum does come up, it's very clear in the uh, regulations and policy that allocation will be prioritized, um, or let me say allocation will be considered favorably, more likely for those MNOs that prioritize roll out into underserviced areas, areas where universal obligations are still lagging behind. Um, so rural areas, peri-urban areas, and, and previously disadvantaged communities. So what does that mean for municipal funding in particular? I'm going to concentrate on infrastructure and not so much the digital side of uh, what what fiber what what fiber facilitates and enables. Um, it's 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 also we we um, the the area the business that that I run we 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 are focused on. So it's probably an easier discussion as well. So municipalities have different choices in how they choose to fund the 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 network rollout. Could be through raising bonds. They could just go to market and. Um, raise a, a bond, um, a municipal bond, but there's there are very particular requirements in order to do that, and you actually have to be a municipality that's already doing pretty well to attract that capital. Uh, they could do it via the balance sheet. They go to a bank. We also fund, we've got a very active public sector area that funds municipalities directly, and they could just access um, balance sheet funding which depends on how well they do, but, but generally I believe they're able to access uh, balance sheet funding. If you are a mini that's well run, you've got sound governance, governance uh, practices, that's, that's great. You don't, it's, it's, it, you don't need intervention from, from a funder in how you roll out, how, how you allocate that funding to the, the asset that you want to fund. And then there's a model where, where we tend to live most of the time, which is the public-private um, partnership model. And it is achieved in many, many different ways and should really only be applied if you've established that there's value for money in delivering uh, the, the, the infrastructure in that way. And from a cash flow perspective, it does allow a municipality to postpone or spread its capital outlay over a number of years uh, in order to deliver that service today. So they don't have to make a huge capital outlay themselves today to fund the ICT infrastructure. They can procure that through a third party and um, uh, they will get the infrastructure today, but pay lease payments or at this tariff structure, whatever they pay for for uh, 
as long as the offtake period runs and for at least the minimum period of a loan. So I, the reason why I believe in, in this model is because I think it allows the Muni to access competitive pricing, um, new technology solutions, um, and, for, and, and, and for funders and, and of the telco operator, the FNO, it allows us to ring fence that, that risk to a particular asset, uh, cash flow model, uh, FNO operator with a level of track record that makes it all comfortable, that they'll deliver on the, the Muni's um, um, scope. Uh, and service requirements. And what it also brings for, for a municipality is it introduces rigor in the procurement. If it works really well, it is probably one of the more transparent ways. And, and in many instances, we've seen probably the least corrupt friendly mechanism to do to raise funding. It can be done as uh, a boot or um, there's different models designed, built, own, operate and transfer back to municipality. It could be design, build, op, operate and lease. And ultimately, the municipality has to decide what is its exit strategy, at which point, how involved do they want to be? It also impacts the ability to attract an investor to look at this at all. The, 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 the methodology, um, the, the type of model you choose, the type of PP, PPP model you choose. I think what's most important is because a municipality is now asking a third party to provide a service on its behalf, the compensation regime must match that service. So the offtake from the municipality must at least match the loan repayment profile. So the, the, the municipal budgetary period of three years is, is probably not going to pay off um, that, that um, network if it's as extensive as we believe it would be to, to really make an impact and deliver services to the community. Strangely, although this is probably the best way to go, if, if you don't have a deep pocket, and you, and, and you can expand the payments over a number of years as opposed to making huge capital outlay out front. It does, from a funder's perspective, we do look at the municipality's balance sheet. We do look to see what underpins they are. Underpins meaning uh, is there a subsidy, a grant, a top-up tariff, a guarantee. And to the extent there isn't, we would then look to structure for that. You know, we might uh, have a base case financial model that speaks to a certain percentage of offtake risk to the municipality um, and a certain level of offtake risk to um, the municipality's corporate um, lessees of that um, uh, piece of infrastructure. So, so that all need to be taken into account. So it's not stock standard. You know, everything has to be exactly the same or, you know, tied in a bow and ready made. It's really about understanding uh, the municipality's um, uh, balance sheet, its strategy, its ICT strategy, and also having a considerable amount of comfort with our borrower, who is the private party. So the bankability challenges, as I mentioned, is that um, lenders don't tend to take end user risk, like a rate payer risk, unless it's a rate payer that's a, a, a corporate. Um, and we understand where we need this infrastructure the most. So we need to consider how do we mitigate that risk? Um, the, the other important thing is that you, in most instances, especially in South Africa, and I think regulation also speaks to this, is you can't take attachment of an asset that's a state asset. So there's a lot of interaction and discussion and contractual arrangements between funders, borrowers, as well as municipality or the state. So we can't get around that. 
even if you've handed over as a municipality to be delivered by a third party, you still need to have a level of engagement um, with the private sector, including the funders through direct agreements, etc., to, to understand your own obligations as a municipality, which might not necessarily be uh, mostly financial, but it's really about understanding your role as being the champion and the owner of the project. What do we need from your side in order to make sure this works? Um, and that could be um, uh, permits, it could be uh, because we can't take actual security of the asset, we need to understand when something goes wrong, what your interaction would be, how would you interact with us? That's that's a contractual arrangement that we that we negotiate together. Um, so having having said that, I think from a from a funders' perspective, FTT uh, fiber fiber market drivers remain robust for funders. The fact that we've got increased mobile traffic, demanding faster, cheaper connectivity, network expansions that require to, to provide socioeconomic upliftment. Uh, it, it's a high capex spend in many instances, and we're likely to see the scaling up of MVNOs, um, mobile virtual networks, which will access increased capacity from existing MO networks, which is enabled by spectrum allocation, of course. Um, the determination by government as well as private sector to make sure that we've got economic inclusivity of entrance of emerging of emerge of, of new emergent players that are experienced because remember funders, because we don't rely on balance sheets. This is an off balance sheet structure. We will require experienced SME infrastructure service providers. Um, and we found actually that there are many out there. Um, um, the, the importance of a spectrum to prioritize closing the digital divide to ensure economic development that encompasses those that have been most impacted by being outside of access to connectivity. And the fact that there's a direct correlation between uh, broadband connectivity and GDP job creation and an access to education and financial financial services means that this type of investment remains extremely attractive to us. And because we fund the ecosystem and not just the FNOs, we understand the interconnectedness between the MNO, why it needs um, um, the FNO to be successful, why it needs a tower code to be successful. Um, we understand the dynamics, and so for us, this remains a very um, important and exciting space to be in. What I would like to end by saying, and maybe that's um, that might be a little controversial, um, I think we have also seen um, certain during COVID, what's, what's been very clear is that we've seen all three telcos, all three listed telcos have reported tremendous growth, revenue growth, driven by COVID in, uh, COVID induced greater data consumption. There has been operational headwinds because there were supply chain and, and CAPEX challenges, but margin structures remained fairly resilient. So to ensure, because because what this looks like to us is that we are still seeing the business as usual clients doing really well. And in order to tilt that a little, we need to look at a different, and when I say we, I'm talking about the private sector and public sector community, we need to look at how we revisit making inroads into delivering ICT infrastructure to municipalities. I think the most, I don't think it's controversial actually, so I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it. Um, there's a huge backlog 
at a national level and to solve for a national problem. What would be really, really interesting to see is how we can work on um, a national municipal ICT network, network rollout strategy and funding strategy and funding model that will streamline procurement regulation and shorten periods and in terms of how long you take to procure. Even better than what we did when we looked at and funded renewable energy. Because that for me, instead of doing it piece by piece, Neil, um, that for me will help us really progress with catching up with backlog, really make a difference uh, to the lives of people that have been outside of this. So I'd, I'd like to leave my, my discussion there, but, but, but I'm really interested in, 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 in how we make changes in a, in, a, in a national and impactful way. And if we could come up with a strategy and a funding model that speaks to that, funding and procurement model that speaks to that, I think we'll achieve that. Uh, that's it for me. I will now return to uh, the discussion to Professor Barry, who will let us know what we're doing next uh, in the program. Thank you so much, Catherine, and that was fascinating. And it's kind of interesting to, um, to um, get a perspective of uh, how the banks are uh, kind of throwing their weight behind this very important problem. And I um, agree with you 100% that that uh, connectivity uh, uh, um, across the board to, um, to to every household and to every little business in our country will have such big multiplier effects that it'll uh, kind of really benefit the whole economy as we've uh, seen with energy. So um, I think there's much food for thought in what, we, what we've heard from you and the previous speakers. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to give uh, listeners, participants, um, a 10 minute break just to, um, we've sort of plowed through your lunch break. So if you want to pop out, grab a coffee, uh, just uh, stretch your legs and be back please in 10 minutes. And then we will um, um, kind of move on to Q&A. And we've got some fascinating questions lined up. So please, nobody go away. Just take a break and please rejoin us in 10 minutes. So that's just before 22. Uh, two. Thank you.
Thank you and good afternoon. And welcome back to the second session, the question and answer session of our interaction this uh, afternoon. Um, there are questions that have been put and published um, and we shall deal with them uh, and we shall try and plaster so we can get as many answered as possible. I think to kick us off, let's uh, start off with uh, one that was directly sent to um, Catherine um, from Mike Pio. Um, this for Catherine. Um, this is very little evidence that municipalities um, can manage infrastructure rollout and delivery, let alone managing customers. Why should the private sector fund further rollouts in the mini C, um, in the mini ICT space directly, rather than allowing the private sector to do um, to do so through mechanisms such as PPPs? Catherine. Hello, hi, thanks for the question, uh, uh, Tavang. I, I think what we are saying, we probably, Mike and I are probably uh, more or less saying the same thing in terms of that it should be um, a public-private partnership that is a service delivery that is delivered by a private party. Um, and that is because I think for municipalities who are the, 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 the capacity, they need to be capacitated. And I think they, it's a big focus for government, getting municipalities capacitated to, to manage and handle these type of, of infrastructure projects. But in the meantime, and, 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 and this is uh, not unique to South Africa, once again, it's not um, nationalization or expropriation when private party does this piece of work for a municipality. It can never be because on commercial terms we we would we would have much more favorable terms if, if it was done on, on, a, on uh, a completely um, no public sector uh, engagement um, because you at least should have the ability to take security of the asset. I think the model the model the model is up for discussion. The best model to access private sector investment and as well as funding. Uh, sh and, and, and to deliver uh, uh, connectivity to citizens of municipalities, that is the model that we should be discussing, how we optimize that. Uh, so for me, it's I don't think Mike and I are very far from each other. Um, I just think we need to understand that it's quite an important asset. Um, and it's one that should uh, be accessible to those that have not seen delivery or connectivity um, in the past. And you can't always trust, um, uh, 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 and it's not their job, for private sector to, 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 to do that. Uh, but it's government's mandate to take care of, uh, and uh, to, to take care of its citizens to the extent that they assist and facilitate with uh, closing the digital divide and creating a, an equal society where, where citizens in municipalities that aren't that well off uh, should benefit and should get that access. So I don't think we can cut municipalities out of the deal. <laughs> I think they, they remain vital. Thanks. Um, Catherine, just switch on your camera for next session. Um, Prof Berry, I've got some questions. Yes, so, um, and it's kind of tagging onto this uh, previous question, but there's a question as well asking um, about um, uh, um, um, COCTA and, and, and the link to, to Department of Communication, and it's really coordination. And I think in the previous question, there was also the sense that, um, that can government do it? Has government got the the, the, the sort of management and project capability to manage these projects and then whether um, the Department of Cooperative Government is aligned with Department of Communication and um, and then um, I'm coming as well to the question of broadband uh, spectrum and, and uh, that's a concern. Um, I see this as maybe being a 
a question for the previous deputy minister who's left, but I wonder if there, if it, if uh, one of the two remaining panelists wants to tackle that. And then I just want to um, tag on uh, the uh, next question, which is about um, this uh, question of uh, capacity as well. And there's a question from uh, Mohammed Chand, who says he spoke to community leaders in one of our townships, Alex, um, at the end of 2019. And they um, highlighted that the fiber rollout in Alex was being held up for some time by COJ. And has there been progress to unlock this? And, and it again speaks to capacity of government to, to uh, do this. So I wonder if there's, um, if uh, one of the panelists, uh, Catherine O'Brien wants to try to tackle this in, um, um, in the absence of the minister. Catherine? Or Brian? Should um, I start first? Yes, please, Catherine. Okay. So, capacity is a. It's capacity, but also preparing project preparation just before that, preparing the project for procurement. It starts there, really, and making sure that um, uh, the project is. The, a feasibility is done properly to see uh, how the project should be structured to make sure that it's something that you can take to market and that it would attract investment. Um, so very good points from everybody, extremely important, I believe, uh, capacity of municipalities. But I think what, what, what PPPs do is they take into account the fact that um, government wants to ensure that most of that capacity uh, is transferred and procured from a third party pub public private sector. It doesn't negate the fact that the project still needs to have proper governance and contract management from the municipality side for it to, to succeed. I think what we're all aware of is that uh, through the Office of the Presidency, through SITSA, um, uh, which is now housed at the DBSA, there's been quite a bit of work done to look at how um, public sector uh, in various, various agencies um, can be capacitated, skills development, and how private sector, from a funding perspective, from a funder's perspective, Banks have been engaged to provide resources into public sector to facilitate with helping projects come to bankability, et cetera. And there are various stages of that assistance. It's not only coming from banks, it's across community, across the, I think, pension funds as well. Other, other industries have been engaged. So government is aware of it. It's not oblivious to the problem. And, and, it has engaged quite extensively with private sector to see how we can bridge that gap because there isn't actually more time to delay it to, to wait for another solution. This this is this is has been identified and I think and I think they're trying to deal with it. But I agree with everyone. You you will not be able to do these projects unless you've got capacity within municipalities and there's ability to contract manage. Um, could I just maybe check whether Brian wants to come in on this in terms of the capacity of the uh, public sector, and especially mun uh, especially municipalities, to sort of manage these? Um, have you got any views on this, Brian? Mary, I mean, I guess my my comment is around the capacity to actually deploy and operate networks, is and and the skills to do that is one thing. The capacity to provide the facilitating conditions uh, and create the appropriate structures is a different thing. Now, now my view is that private sector has, I don't think there's really capacity constraints in terms of the ability to deploy networks. Um, and I think there's probably um, enough um, capacity potentially available in terms of operating them. And I think there's a significant job creation opportunity in the private sector 
um, with regard to both deployment and operation of networks. And my my view is I don't, I would not be advocating that government should start building network deployment and operational capacities. I think what they need to make sure is that they focus on creating the facilitating conditions and the capacity to put in place the necessary special purpose structures, if appropriate, or the necessary um, other funding mechanisms um, to do that. And that includes the, co the, the capacity to have oversight of, you know, where is a network, what sort of what sort of interventions should be made where, what is the most um, beneficial nature of the intervention, uh, and the processes to govern those interventions and make sure they get maximum bang for their buck. Those would be the capacities that I think are needed at, frankly, at national level, provincial level, and um, and municipal level. Thanks, Brian. Um, Taban. Thanks, Raf. Um, there are a couple more questions. Um, they, it's a string of them coming from Mr. Mulema, uh, Stan Mulema. Uh, I'll start with the first one. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll just take two from him. The first says the greater majority of South Africa is densely populated. What cost component makes the rollout of FTTH expensive? Um, is this uh, is it skills, technology, or way leaves, or labor? And the second question is, every established town and township in South Africa has the legacy copper network on poles running in the back street. One pole can supply four homes. Um, why can't this infrastructure be used to deploy uh, aerial fiber? Uh, wouldn't it be cheaper and rapid? Uh, shouldn't municipalities partner with network operators in this regard? Um, something tells me that uh, Prof. Brian, you may be the person that is uh, uh, targeted to. Thanks, Tabang. Um, so dealing with the first question about the cost structures. Um, so, I mean, there's two, as, as I showed in my presentation, CapEx is, is a major cost structure, albeit not necessarily always the dominant one. So with regard to CapEx, there's two main drivers. The one is, of course, the amount of fiber you have to deploy per home. Um, so whether you deploy eight meters of fiber to reach a home on the average home or whether you deploy 20 um, is, is, is a big cost driver. The cost per meter of fiber has come down a lot. And typically at the moment, we're talking in the region of 350 to 400 Rand per running meter of street fiber to deploy. So that's, that's quite a big um, driver of cost. The second um, capital uh, component is the cost of getting into the home and the customer premise equipment and the network terminating device. So every home, if unless you're using some sort of uh, sort of local Wi-Fi solution to cover several homes, but each each network endpoint, each fiber network endpoints need what's called an ONT, uh, um, an optical network termination device. Uh, that costs about 800 rand or a thousand rand. Every the home needs a, um, a a router, which is about another 500 to 800 rand, or maybe a thousand. And then there's what's called the drop fiber, which is the cost of getting from the street into the home, and that can be a thousand as well. So the sort of the rule of thumb is to get into a home costs about 2,500 bucks, and then on top of that you need the um, you need the router. So you're looking at off the order of three grand per home. Um, so that's the, the that's that's the second component of of capex. What people often forget, they think, okay, so we'll sort out the capex and then everything will be fine. What people often forget is the opex. Um, and just to put this in context, so let's talk about network operators. If we look at the opex of network operators, let's look at a few that we have published, you know, publicly available information. OpenServe spends 75% of its total revenue on OPEX. Um, BBI spends 54% of its total revenue on OPEX. This is OPEX to keep the, to, the, it's to keep the network running, to do wholesale sales and marketing, which is limited, to maintain the network, to do second and third line customer care, wholesale billing, all the IT systems, upgrades, all that sort of stuff. 
Um, and so, as I said, open serve 75% of revenues, OPEX, BBI, 54%. You could say, okay, maybe they're inefficient operators. Let's go to what would be considered an efficient operator. BT open reach, 44% of their revenue is OPEX. Um, admittedly, this is fully allocated OPEX. So you're paying for all the sunk, you know, all the firm infrastructure and everything. But if you if you speak to um, operators, you find that the marginal OPEX per customer is of the order of 25 rand a month. So for each new customer they add, it's going to cost you 25 rand a month, call it 300 rand a year. That's just for the network operator. Then the ISP also has OPEX. Um, and if you look at South African ISPs, you find that depending on their size and their efficiency, their fully allocated OPEX is of the order of 50 to 90 Rand a month. So this covers um, sales and marketing, customer care, billing, IT systems, internet breakout and peering. Um, it covers any amortization of the upfront router and connection fee expenses and so on. So that's the fully allocated cost. Admittedly, again, you're paying for the legacy firm infrastructure and so on. So even if you look at the marginal OPEX per customer, so how much extra would it cost them per new customer added? You're looking in the region of 15 to 30 Rand per customer added plus interconnect charges or, and pairing, we call it 5% of the recommended retail price. So the OPEX, is, you know, it's, 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 yes, it's a combination of labor, um, which includes both skilled and unskilled labor. It's a, um, IT systems, um, a little bit of network um, costs and maintenance, but certainly the, the the cost drivers in running a network, the point I'm trying to make is yes, there, there's a significant capex in terms of the fiber rollout down the street, as well as the fiber connection into the home, but there's one mustn't forget the ongoing operational costs of keeping the network running, connecting to customers. And when I've had conversations with, with government organizations and a lot of the early um, metropolitan network rollouts, it was a case of only looking at the, you know, oh, it will cost us 2 billion Rand to deploy the network. Yeah, right. But it will cost you half a billion a year to run the network. And that often gets overlooked. So that's, that's the question with regard to um, the, the sort of the cost dynamics. I think the, with regard to the, the the copper infrastructure in townships, if I recall correctly, Telcom had about 4 million telephone lines. At most, 4 million homes would have um, copper infrastructure going into them. Um, so there's probably 2 million of those homes that haven't yet had access to, to fiber or something, maybe two and a half. Um, and my... Looking at, I mean, I'm not, I, uh, I'm an observer of telecom now like everybody else, um, but it seems to me that they are emphasizing the use of that copper infrastructure to actually deploy aerial fiber, and that is one of their strategies. I think the important thing is they own, they own that infrastructure. They own the poles. They own the copper infrastructure. So the, the use of that would happen by them or with them. Thanks, Prof. Uh, Prof. Berry. Yes, uh, thank you, Brian. And it's it's a kind of related question. It comes also from Stan Molemo. And um, but I um, think that I heard Catherine speak about this. And it's this question of uh, digging once. Um, and I've, uh, from my own personal experience, having been involved in Vitz's um, Simolochon precinct, and when we put uh, put in fiber. Uh, it was so frustrating to see one company come in and uh, dig up the road and put in fiber and then a few months later some other company came up and put in fiber as well. And I think uh, the question from Stan is um, about 20 years, or, uh, 20 years ago or so, we spoke of digging once. For new developments, shouldn't there be a policy decision to cater for broadband um, services from the time of breaking ground. So um, shouldn't we be um, saying if we build anything new, we should kind of um, a plan for broadband and not have this digging up and digging up? And I guess it's a question both in terms of 
uh, regulation and municip municipalities giving permission, but as well, if the funding is coming from a bank, surely the bank should make that a condition. So um, to um, um, to Catherine first, and then maybe if there's a follow on from Brian. Uh, thanks, Barry. So, so I think for me, what is sorry, let me get the level right. So I think for me, what's important is Stan is correct that um, how you how you deploy the fiber is important from a funding perspective. We just wouldn't. I mean, that doesn't make any business sense to us. To you, you have to look at what's around you. Um, so we're going to look at the business model in its entirety. Uh, what what I think what and in in a in a in the private sector, it's probably um, easier to manage that. I think if you if you fun, if you are rolling out to estates or uh, developments, it's probably I think easier to manage. You, the, the 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 service providers can confirm that themselves. Um, I think from a municipal perspective, if a municipality does it, as in they are procuring a PPP. I'm not sure how they they manage that, and I don't. I'm not sure what the legislation provides in that respect. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have the right answer for you, for you, Stan. But but commercially to attract funding, you would have had to consider that. Uh, and I just uh, was in fact wondering whether Brian's got an insight on this. Um, I, yeah, just two quick points. Certainly, I mean, I agree with the principle wholeheartedly. I think with regard to um, public sector new developments, it certainly is, um, it would be wise for the re relevant authorities to make sure that when new developments uh, get um, commissioned, that the duct infrastructure is deployed upfront. Um, just as you deploy water and electricity infrastructure, you should be deploying digital infrastructure upfront in a new development. Um, and that would certainly fall to the relevant um, sphere of government to make sure that that happens. In the case of private sector, um, absolutely the same applies, but there's a, there's a bit of a caveat here. Um, and there was a fashion um, from sort of 2013, 2014, um, that essentially new developers see this as a rent seeking opportunity. And they say, oh, we're going to deploy this amazing new gated, gated co um, community, uh, but now you have to work through our ducting and, and they actually charge, um, in some cases, rather large fees to the service provider, or indeed that um, commercial property um, landlords do the same. And that this sort of rent seeking behavior, in my opinion, on the part of landlords or developers is unhelpful. Um, it frustrates the free market operating in these in these areas. It frustrates service based competition. Um, it makes it more complex for the network operators and the ISPs to operate. They add no value whatsoever, and I think that should be avoided. Can I just also Thanks. mention something something in addition to that, Tabam? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So I think it was also important to understand. Remember, it's much easier for us to find private sector. It always has been. It's yes, uh, more challenging to find into a project, even though we find private sector and it has um, a public sector link for for the reasons that have been mentioned, right? Um, but I think going forward, what's going to be important in terms of planning from both a private and a public sector perspective. If their networks are talking about efficiencies now, if their networks are incorporate a certain level of additional solutions and not just connectivity, some smart energy solutions, um, smart grid development, um, et cetera. Um, and, and that's important because as investors, as funders, people who, who provide us with their deposits, um, trust funds, et cetera, or um, infrastructure funds, they're looking for smart investments, green investments. Um, 
So a suggestion that what Brian's talking about rent seeking that they will investigate all of that as well. Um, and so it's important to have that in mind that you need to um, design very smartly. You need to plan very smartly in order to attract the right level of investment. Thanks, Catherine. So um, let's proceed now. Um, again, uh, Prof. Uh, um, Armstrong, uh, Peter says, cost of network deployment are increased by government. Delays in swing, um, waylees, uh, sorry, delay, delays in issuing uh, way leaves, um, disruptions by local community associations during construction, etc. Would you cost, uh, would your cost estimates and break even points increase if these were considered? So my model, um, the, the, the way my model works is the clock starts ticking when you break ground down the street. Um, so I'm assuming that the cost of capital to the point of first um, first uh, turn of soils, let's just say, or, or first pole being planted, um, that the cost of capital up to that point is zero. So if, as Peter says, if you're sitting, if you have to sit on your cash and um, do to sort of twiddle your thumbs while you're waiting for way leaves, um, yeah, that would that would increase the the costs. I'm not sure how. How material it would be from from the perspective of my model, but I can understand that in a capital intensive industry, um, sitting on your hands with your capital in the bank while you wait for government is very frustrating. So thanks, thank you. Prof. Let me take another one and I'll give you. Yes. A um, uh, there's a question from Tabo, and he. Um, He's um, saying that uh, he's been in the connectivity space, connecting households and businesses for the last eight to 10 years. And um, I'm guessing that he's a small or medium business and he, he's kind of asking, um, how does one collaborate in order to tackle bigger projects and to, and, uh, to add value and experience in the space? So, it's um, kind of really important in terms of the small and medium operators in the space. And um, how do we uh, get critical mass and, and get collaboration? Uh, can I um, just sort of throw this out to you both? And if either of you have a comment on that. Um, let me have a go. Um, so I, I do know, I think industry associations are a useful vehicles. So for I know, I know, for example, um, there are certain ICT small business um, associations that are pursuing some bigger projects. And being part of those associations actually can be one way to become part of a sort of a bigger, let's call it a constellation of small businesses that are going after bigger opportunities. I think that's that's the one area. I guess there would secondly be a role for for government to play or or some other institutional body, whether it is an industry association, to actually to, to more actively create platforms for collaboration of small businesses. I think a third area, and um, I don't mean to um, how should I say, uh, speak against the hosts of the show, but I think the South African banking sector as a whole is, is they talk a good story with regard to small businesses, but I'm not sure that they follow through all the time. And finding the, and I know, I know it's, I know there's all issues of risk profiles, et cetera, et cetera, um, but finding mechanisms to actually, um, it, even if this constellation of small businesses comes together to pursue bigger projects, um, how, how funding could be made available to those. I think that would be up to, to Catherine to talk to. Uh, um, Catherine, Catherine. Are, you going, are you going to defend us there? I think, Barry, that was quite a... Yeah, no, I'll, I'll have to keep that one for our next talk. I'll have to see how I get back at you for our next talk. But um, absolutely right. We do have a certain risk profile that's more um, um, comfortable than, than others. But I think that um, 
you'd probably be surprised at who we do support in the FNO space um, from a from a from a from a, a a player that was probably not a business as usual player. Um, we have definitely making more on roads inroads in other sectors, um, uh, in tower sector, etc. In terms of supporting uh, SMME type um, businesses on really big big tickets, and that's really based on the fact that they do have some track record and they do have offtakes from really good MNOs, you know, in terms of credit worthiness. So that does factor into it. Uh, to do an off balance sheet deal, which I think is what is being suggested because they don't have balance sheet, um, does require you to have exceptional track record. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have deep pockets, but we are willing to structure a deal that mitigate a lot of the risk uh, that you would usually find with somebody in a project finance deal that doesn't have deep pockets. So I think it will be on a case by case basis. I have to emphasize over and over again that uh, economic inclusive participation is no longer optional. So, um, uh, the MNOs that require all this passive infrastructure to, to transport and transmit the connectivity end user um, services, um, they actually know that for them to continue to be in such a great position when it comes to things like spectrum, etc., cetera, um, have to show that they prioritizing um, uh, um, doing that, you know, putting 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 out uh, and subcontracting with players uh, that would facilitate to to close the digital divide for our community. So, I think the time, the regulation, the synergies are right to to make more inroads on that, and um, and, and funders will probably. Uh, um, but because of market dynamics come to the party. I, I seriously believe that. I, definitely in the in the tower space, we we starting to look at that. Or we let me not say start, we are we are funding that space. Okay, no, thanks. Could I could I just actually quickly come in here, um, Tabang, and to just go back to Tabo's um question. And you were talking about um collaboration between smaller between these kind of smaller um, companies or operators. And I was uh, just wondering whether um, the um, lenders would look at consortia or groupings of small companies more favorably than, um, than if they kind of came to you individually. So would you sort of pull their, their um, kind of balance sheets into one a bigger picture, or is it uh, hard to do that? Uh, you, mute. I'm not sure if I should take this one for for us, but yeah. But ahead. I think that I think that the the the, the challenge. Listen, the 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 number. The consortium number or size uh, is 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 less of importance than the ability to deliver from a technical perspective. That's extremely important because you know we use other people's money, so so it's not even it's not Nedbank's money. It's it's our investors' depositors' money. So so track record has to be there. That's the first essential. Secondly, when you bring together lots of people, administratively, obviously, there's some challenges because we have to do all our checks, speaker, whatever. And it's like the, the bigger the organogram, the longer it takes for you to get to that money. That's just practical. That's just, you know, what needs to be done to get there. But, but it's track record and it's structure. They, they have to be um banks cannot create the structure for them you know in terms of corporate structure how they organize we can't engage in that we we look at a business model a business plan 
we evaluate that and then we fund against that. Um, so that still remains important that they have those necessary uh, skills and expertise. Um, and um, so the people that we're funding that are sort of SME in terms of their characteristical features have got that capability in terms of how they organize and to the extent uh, that they that they don't, the bridge to that is really, really short. Yeah, OK, Thank thanks. Um, there, there is a question here from Peter, um, which I think uh, it still relates to some lending story. It says, how do lenders view the potential of PPP agreement default or disruption by municipalities? The PPP model requires a capable and committed municipality during build and operations. The city of Tuani achieved this for Isizu. However, the boot model uh, in 2016 to deploy fiber, the Tobela Altec network involved municipal offtake, commercial services, and the ability to deploy fiber in residential areas. This project fell foul of a change in the political governance of the municipality. So I guess the first question is that one. How do lenders view the potential of PPP agreement uh, default slash uh, disruption by municipalities. Uh, Catherine, uh, unmute, please. In one word, we view it very grimly. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, that's why I said that although PPPs are great for municipality that wants to use its, um, you know, for the CFO that wants to use its balance sheet to much needed services and rather deploy um, uh, payments for an IC, for an, an ICT network over time uh, through a PPP, uh, we still need that municipality to be able to, to manage itself. So a PPP doesn't allow the municipality to manage, to execute on the project, but there's still somebody that needs to be in the office that look at the contracts to see when payments come in, uh, to make sure that they've budgeted properly. And so a very big element of PPPs for municipalities is how do we achieve uh, collection accounts so that you know that, that the funding for the, the payment for lease payments or services to an F and O will be ring fence, will be certain, will be secure. Um, that's still a very di big, big, difficult element of not uh, making PPP successful for municipalities because they it just goes into a you know into a, a collective pot and then you know they apply to services and needs that they have to and so no we we don't look very well on termination and and disruption and 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 we would have direct agreements but direct agreements any agreement with municipalities is only as good as the ability of the municipality internally to manage itself and and be properly capacitated. Thank well, you. Can I, if, yeah, if, if that, I, I think for me a critical yeah. issue, and this is the commercial sustainability of the PPP. It needs to be based on a, on a proper on, on a proper model where the commercial sustainability is properly assessed in terms of, you know, I mean, the, you know, how much is it going to cost to get the fiber? Can the people pay? Are they going to pay? Um, and if, if I think about some of the big um, municipal networks that have happened in South Africa, City of Cape Town, Etiquani, Ekuruleni, City of Joburg, Chwani. Um, most of those have ended in tears simply because the commercial model was half-baked and there wasn't sufficient priority given to how is this going to work after the network's deployed, how are we going to look after the operational expenses, how are we going to look after billing, how are we going to look after customer care um, to actually create a sustainable network. And many of those programs was a case, we're going to go to the market, we'll go with a big capital project, someone will build a network and and we'll sort it out after that. And the reality is there's no reason on earth why a municipality will be better at running a network than a telecom or a Vodacom or a Dark Fiber Africa or a Vumatel or an Internet Solutions or an Altec or whoever. So the right commercial model, it's a partnership. Let the private sector do what they do well. Um, and get create the right commercial structure and um, have a have a, a real a properly workable business plan that looks into what happens once the network's built. I, I think Barry, I'm um, not Barry, I think Brian, 
the understanding around what a PPP is supposed to do is probably not as crystal clear. And probably yeah. the model that you're speaking to is actually not how funders would. Funders are very skittish about a risk model that doesn't talk to what you're talking to, that doesn't talk to what is the O&M structure going forward, at which point does ref major refurbishments come in, how is that budgeted for, are there reserve accounts in place? They don't reach the agreement with the municipality. They don't have a single discussion around the model, the business model, payments with the municipality. The municipality is actually outside of this discussion and only involved in so far as we want to know how um, that private party is going to, where the revenue is going to come from. Is it coming through a municipality's purse? Is it coming through ratepayers within the municipality? And um, personally, we don't believe that you have to own something to have access to it. You know, um, you don't have to own something to have access to it. Similarly, a municipality doesn't have to own the infrastructure to have access to it. But what you're trying to protect against is making sure that the big fiber companies and FNOs, uh, much like the MNOs, do not forget that they are universal obligations, that there are people that still do not have access to, to, to connectivity that are lagging behind, not because you know, because we know what telcos, what what telecommunication service does in terms of not only stimulating the economy but education, and it, there's so many touch points that it impacts if you do not have access to that. Mm -hmm. So, how is the private party motivated to do that? Private party will go where the deal is easiest to that to do, where they get the most arpus, as we used to say. Um, so, so I think there has to be a balance reach when we look at a deal. We're certainly not going to leave open the suggestion that for the next, I don't know, 7, 10, 15 years that our funding is in there, that we don't know where OPEX is, how OPEX is going to be paid. Or <laughs> it's it's impossible to fund that way. I'm not sure how the others were procured, but I, I, I would, um, the, I don't quite understand even what went, went wrong in the examples that you mentioned, but that's not generally how project finance lenders um, approach a project finance lend. They, they rely completely on the private party to deliver. Um, could I come in and um, I see that uh, time is whizzing by and I'm going to ask two questions once. And one's really targeted at Catherine again, and then uh, one is picking up on this point Catherine has just made, and I'd like to kind of hear Brian's uh, comments on it. So the question to Catherine is, uh, do the bank, and it's from Tabo again, and uh, do the banks cater for those kind of scenarios where communities have formed a co-op to roll out such infrastructure, and uh, where the banks consider that, and then a question from Stan uh, that I'd like to um, target maybe to Brian and just picks up on this point Catherine has just made is it, um, and it's um, the quest is to broaden access um, to the internet and um, Stan is asking is it not blurred by our focus on cost rather than on opportunities and I was wondering if you've ever tried in your models Brian to build in those broader opportunities rather than the purely commercial model. So looking at, at other kind of aspects of the of the advantage of having connectivity. So um, could I in fact maybe go firstly to Brian because it's following on from what Catherine said and then about co-ops. So so I think the short answer in my model is I haven't looked at sort of collateral benefits and financializing their collateral benefits. There is no doubt that there are significant collateral finance collateral benefits which would ultimately work their way through into the economy. Um, but the um, how should I say the the logic of that is very tenuous and difficult to model. So, for example, we've all heard the um, 
the story that a 10% increase in, in broadband penetration leads to a 1% increase in GDP growth, right? Um, so, by the way, that is that is broadly true. It is particularly true for fixed infrastructure. The research that I've read is that that is, in, ironically, it's not actually true for mobile infrastructure. But the there is evidence that a 10% increase in fixed broadband infrastructure does lead to a 0.5% increase or is associated with, let's be clear here, is associated with anywhere between a half and one and a half percent increase uh, in, in GDP. The reason I chose my words carefully around associated with is it's not clear which has, there's no, the, the, the research has no, hasn't established causality. The research has not been able to say that it was broadband that drove the growth the economic growth rather than it could also plausibly be that economic growth creates the space and the capacity in the economy to fund the fund the broadband rollout. So so the research is not is not clear on that. So therefore, in in trying to financialize the collateral benefits, um, you have to be careful to do it at a level of rigor that is believable um, and that investors would actually be prepared to to believe and put up the money. Um, I think, though, you know, I mean, so what my analysis was trying to do is ultimately it says, you know, this has to be sustainable. Whatever we do has to be sustainable. And if the collateral benefits will flow to someone else in the ecosystem, then ultimately that doesn't fund the sustainability. Second point is maybe people will be eventually be prepared to pay more. You know, the, the rule of thumb is that People spend between two, three, and five percent of their household income on communications. Um, that might go up to ten percent as people see how critical it is for education, for economic participation, um, as well as entertainment. And I think that will go up, and therefore these price points may go up. So I do think there's a huge opportunity. Um, the pragmatist in me says, though, people will actually put their money into the project when they see. And discounted cash flows that works. Thank you, Brian. And uh, then just to that previous question, um, Catherine, in terms of co-ops, would uh, that be fundable through the banking system? Yeah, so I think it's important to understand that that okay, so banks are, are, are constrained by Basel. So what that means is that Basel has a risk model for all the commercial banks. To the extent the risk model becomes untenable, the, the, the more riskier deal, and which is gonna, where I'm going to come to now, the more riskier deal, uh, the, the, the higher the pricing. So, so, so uh, but pricing doesn't solve everything. It still needs to be a deal that works. It still needs to be a deal that's commercially viable. And I can only fund what I can model. So in combining the answer with what, what um, uh, uh, my colleague on, on, on the panel said, is that if, if I can't quantify um, the benefits and I can't model it, then it becomes very difficult to fund it. The model has to stack up and then I can talk about all the other great stuff that comes from doing this deal in, in, in our environment. So co-ops co are, we are now getting higher and higher up the risk curve and there are banks available that fund that. It's not a commercial bank. You know, that is why development financing exists. Uh, development financing is to, to I guess, Look and look at transactions and enable transactions, which, quite frankly, a commercial bank should not have a mandate to do, because we've got a very specific mandate. We've got very specific hurdles to meet, and so uh, even when I speak about us looking at transactions that are or SME type borrowers, they they we still plug into our model quantifiable measurements to make sure we get them closer to the money. Uh, they don't bypass that. It still still has to be a commercial deal that makes sense. Um, the further I said, the further we veer away from that, the further the more riskier the deal that becomes. Price will not mitigate the risk. 
uh, it will not compensate for the risk. You know, um, then we need to talk to perhaps the, the best bank to accompany that borrower or that co-op is probably a development bank. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for that. I think the last question may be going to Prof Armstrong um, about how much progress has been made from a regulatory perspective for sharing of fiber optic amongst the internet service providers. Yeah, so I mean, firstly, I must confess I'm not fully up to date with where exactly we are in terms of active or passive infrastructure sharing obligations on the operators. But I think I would say that the issue has become less important in South Africa for two reasons. I think the first is that we are an effective and efficient wholesale market for fixed infrastructure has been established. So you have OpenServe, you have DFA, you have Vumatel, you have some others, and they make their fiber available um, on, a, on a pretty effective wholesale basis. So I think that's, that's the first point I'd like to make. I think um, the second point I'd like to make is, I don't see a lot of, of um, how should we say, duplication of infrastructure. So we, we, we started off having quite a lot of double build. You'd have one, for, one guy going down one side of the street and another guy going down another side. Um, I don't think there's that much of it, particularly in the areas that are now being built out. You know, um, so, and it is in that wholesale, that wholesale, the wholesaler's interest then to make that infrastructure available on a, on a means that they get the maximum returns from that investment as quickly as they can. And that's all about uptake. And I think the point is they all actually now have, uh, a new, you know, they, they sell through ISPs. Their preferred model is to sell through through ISPs on a non-preferential basis. So in a sense, they're making their fiber available. There are some models in the world, for example, in Singapore, where the state initially created a passive infrastructure company. Um, and now that is um, that is a listed entity, so it provides it's a sort of a, a mandated passive infrastructure wholesale provider. Um, that is that is one model. But my sense is the the issue in South Africa isn't so much now needing regulation at that level. I think there's more need for regulation in terms of, or not regulation is the wrong word, more need for intervention um, in the mobile space where if if one acknowledges that you know the the majority of south africans access the internet through mobile infrastructure we do not yet have an efficient market for mobile data a wholesale market um, and that is a market structure issue which my view is that if we did have an efficient effective wholesale market for mobile data it would be beneficial for south africans do you have a last word, Catherine, that you want to throw in? I'm on mute again. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity, uh, uh, Tabang and team. Uh, I've got no further um, comments. I'd just like to say we should talk some more. I picked up on some very interesting points today that I'd like to discuss further. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Prof Be Berry, your last word, please. Um, yes, it's been a fascinating discussion and I want to thank the panel. So yes, it's been great and I think the conversation should, def should definitely continue. Prof Brian, your closing remark? Um, yeah, just firstly, thanks for the opportunity of being part of this. I think it's a really important conversation. Um, it is, you know, one that needs to, to carry on. Be it's an important conversation because broadband connectivity is a fundamentally important issue. It is fundamentally important to em empowering the majority of South Africans to participate in the digital economy. And we're not where we need to be yet. So it's been my pleasure to participate. Hopefully I've made a few contributions and the conversation needs to continue. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much indeed. And on a on a very light note, it looks like if I also want to be a professor, I must change my name to start with a B. Um, maybe I'll be a professor. <laughs> but I wish to thank you, uh, the panelists, uh, especially those that uh, the, the two of you, Prof Armstrong and um, Catherine, for staying with us until the very end. And in absentia, um, um, MEC Park Stau and uh, um, Alan for also for their contribution. Most importantly, also to, uh, to thank the people that have been on this webinar have contributed with their questions and behind the scenes, uh, Johnny Dezel, Tula Lamini for your great work, Chris, uh, um, as well for your great and ex excellent, Chris Eland, by the way, uh, for your contribution and, and assistance all the time. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this has uh, been a series of five webinars that we have held this year. Um, um, three of those have been on energy and two on the ICT. And we are hoping that we can continue as uh, it seems to be a consensus, at least on this panel, that more talk needs to be had around the issues that uh, concern us and that concern our nation. I wish to thank you very much um, and also to alert you that uh, a report will be circulated um, of this uh, webinar and those that have registered will obviously be able to get both the video and the written report. Uh, with that said, I really wish to thank you and thank you to all and everyone until we meet again next time. Thank you. Thank you. There we go, guys.